Time, time is very precious to me. I don't know how much I have left, and I have some things that I would like to say. Now I'm, I'm fighting cancer. Everybody knows that. Uh, and people ask me all the time about how you, you go through your life and how's your day. How do you get through uh, life or, or each day is the same thing? To me, there are three things we all should do every day. If we do this every day of our life, you're going to have, what a wonderful, number one is laugh. You should laugh every day. Number two is think. You should spend some time in thought. And number three is you should have your emotions moved to tears. Could be happiness or joy. But think about it. If you laugh, you think, and you cry, that's a full day. That's a heck of a day. You do that seven days a week, you're going to have something special. And I always have to think about what's important in life is to think to me of three things. Where you started, where you are, where you're going to be. Those are the three things that I try and do every day. You know, when I think about getting up and giving a speech, I can't help it. I have to remember the first speech I ever gave. I was coaching at Rutgers University. That was my first job. And I was the freshman coach. That's when freshmen played on freshman team. And I was so fired up about my first job. So my idol as a coach was Vince Lombardi. And I read this book called Commitment to Excellence by Vince Lombardi. And in the book, Lombardi talked about the first time he spoke before his Green Bay Packer team in the locker room. They were perennial losers. It was the first one I ever gave. And I read this thing, Lombardi, what he said was, he didn't go in. He waited. His team was wondering, where is he? Where is this great coach? He's not there. Ten minutes. He's still not there. Three minutes before they have to take the field, Lombardi comes in, bangs the door open, and he walked in, and he just walked back and forth like this, just walked, staring at the players. And he said, all eyes on me. And he said, gentlemen, we will be successful this year. You can focus on three things and three things only. Your family, your religion, and the Green Bay Packers. And, he, and the rest of it, they knocked the walls down. The rest was history. I said, that's beautiful. I'm going to do it. Your family, your religion, and Rutgers basketball. That's it. I had it. I'm, listen, I'm 21 years old. The kids I'm coaching are 19. All right? And, I, and I'm going to be the greatest coach in the world, the next Lombardi. And I'm ready. And I'm practicing out in the right side of the locker room. The, the manager's telling me, you got to go in. Not yet, not yet. Family, religion, Rutgers basketball. All eyes on me. I got, I got. And now finally he said, three minutes. I said, fine. True story. I go to knock the doors open, just like the money. Boom. It didn't open. I almost broke my arm. I was like, you know, it was one that didn't open. Now I'm down. The players are looking. You know, coach, get you know, help the coach up. Help him up. Yeah. And now I did like Lombardi. I walked back and forth. Right? And I was going like that with my arm, get the feeling back in it. And finally I said, gentlemen, all eyes on me. These kids wanted to play. They're 19. Let's go. I said, gentlemen, we'll be successful this year if you can focus on three things and three things only. He said, your family, your religion, and the Green Bay Packers, I told you. <laughs> I did that. I remember that. And the screen is flashing up there 30 seconds like I can't about that screen right now, huh? I got, I got, I got tumors all over my body. I'm worried about some guy in the back going 30 seconds. Huh? Now I, I look at where I, I am now and I know what I want to do. What I would like to be able to do is to spend whatever time I have left and to give and maybe some hope to others. 500,000 people will die this year of cancer. And I'll also tell you that one in every four will be afflicted with this disease. And yet, for somehow, we seem to have put it in a little bit of the background. I want to bring it back on the front table. We need your help. I need your help. We need money for research. It may not save my life. It may save my children's lives. It may save someone you love. And it's very important. And ESPN has been so kind to support me in this endeavor and allow me to announce tonight that we are starting the Jim, Jimmy V Foundation for Cancer Research. And it's, and its motto is, don't give up, don't ever give up. And that's what I'm going to try to do. Every minute that I have left, I will thank God for the day and the moment I have. And if you see me, smile and maybe give me a hug, because that's important to me too. I, I've got to go. All right, so that wasn't a plug for you to give money for cancer, but certainly a plug to go through life every day, to laugh, to smile, to cry, to say hello to people, 
always amazes me if you go into a store and you say hello and you ask somebody, how are they? How is your day? And they look at you and they smile. It just changes the entire day. So try that. Focus on that. So let's get to natural resources. You've seen this image before and you saw a video in week one that talked about all of the elements embedded in a smartphone. Right? It was that video where they talk about sexy elements like neodymium and dysprosium. And I want to make a point here, and I hope this lecture makes this really clear for everybody, that when you look at the image on your screen here, you're looking at the elements that are directly embedded in the smartphone, meaning that they are physically a part of the smartphone. If you take your smartphone and you hold it in your hand, you're holding all of these elements. You're holding indium, you're holding tin, you're holding oxygen, you're holding down here terbium and dysprosium and gadolinium, all of these sexy rare earth elements. You're holding lithium and cobalt and aluminum and carbon and oxygen. We often talk about lithium ion batteries and down here on the lower left, all five of these elements are required to make lithium ion batteries, not only lithium. When you look at that case, Without the case protector, that case contains carbon and magnesium and bromine and nickel. All four of those elements are directly embedded in that casing. And then we look at the electronics. Imagine the guts of your smartphone. All of these elements over here on the right that are embedded directly into the electronics of your smartphone. Elements like copper. Remember the copper age that we talked about. Other metals of antiquity, silver and gold. Other metals that we've only discovered within that last hundred years, tantalum. And then a whole host of other metals here. And you'll see between the screen and the electronics and the casing and the battery that you have some elements that can be in all four of those components of your smartphone. So one of the things I'm going to do today is introduce this concept of direct resources and also talk about indirect resources. When we think about the resources that we consume, this is an image of an American baby born in the year 2019. And the data and the image are from a group called the Minerals Education Coalition, and their website is down here on the lower right if you care to look into the materials that they have uh, available on their site. And all I want you to do now, I'll be quiet for a few seconds, is just take a look at all of these resources, these words around the baby, and notice the quantity, the number that's associated with each of these resources. We have gold up here at the top right. We have lead, another metal of antiquity. We've got stone and sand and gravel, coal, other minerals and metals, aluminum, zinc, iron ore, copper, cement, petroleum, natural gas, phosphate rock, salt, and clays. This is only a sample of all the resources that we'll consume over our lifetime. And I just want to give you a sense that this is on a per capita, per baby basis born in America. For every baby born in 2019, that baby will accompany the use of 53,071 pounds of cement, 980 pounds of copper, 20,127 pounds of iron ore, 466 pounds of zinc, these are all of the resources that are both embedded directly in all of the products that this baby is going to consume. And also, as I'll walk you through today, they are part of the supply chain manufacturing all of the products that this baby will use. So in 2021, we, meaning Americans, consume a phenomenal quantity of resources. Here are data from Follow My Cursor from the bottom left, 1961 through 2012. The y-axis is millions of metric tons. So just think of the y-axis is zero is obviously zero, and moving up is increasing 
the total quantity of a particular resource that we consume, and this is specifically for the United States. And over here, the legend on the right indicates that we've got tin, nickel, lead, zinc, copper, aluminum, raw steel, and we consume iron to make steel, wood, and cement. And all I want you to see here is that while there certainly are some fluctuations over time, on average, we are consuming more of each of these resources now than we did throughout the last 60 years. Now, I highlight here with the black arrow that the mortgage crisis in 2008-2009, which caused a great recession initially in the United States, but certainly fanned out globally, that great recession, as we'll touch on throughout the term, was responsible for a significant decline in the average income or net worth of U.S. citizens. And whenever we have less money, we have less disposable money, less disposable income. And when we have less disposable income, we buy less stuff. And so we can see here the direct result of the mortgage crisis and the Great Recession in 2008-2009 which caused a significant decline in the consumption of all of these resources in the United States. However, today, from 2012 through 2021, we've seen a full recovery. We can look here at a similar set of data for the entire world. So again, the y-axis is, in this case, billions of tons, and the x-axis is time starting in 1900 and ending in 2009, and you're looking here at the development in global use of construction materials, ore and industrial minerals, fossil energy carriers, biomass. And again, all I want you to take away here, I don't want you to memorize the data. I want you to see the trend for each of these different categories of natural resources. If we look at construction minerals, and we go back to the year 1900, let's call that about 8 billion tons for the entire world. 8 billion tons in 1900 is today about 80 billion tons. Remember, this ends in 2009, and so I can tell you that if we extrapolated this to 2021, we're at about 80 billion. So that's an order of magnitude increase. If we look at ores and industrial minerals here in orange, and we go back to 1900, we're at about 7 billion tons, and today we're approaching 50 billion tons. So I want you to see the trends here that are similar to those I showed you in the second week's lecture. And I just want you to take away that we are significantly increasing the amount or the quantity of natural resources that we consume. Now, one of the things we'll come back, about, we'll come back and talk about over the course of the semester, looking at these data, we have here on the y-axis millions of metric tons, and the x-axis is time, 1900 through this is about 2016. And again, we have a number of different categories here. We have the grayer construction materials. We have this blue here, the darker blue are industrial minerals, which we'll define in the class. We've got the red, which are recycled metals. Then we've got the green here, which are primary metals, gold, silver, copper, that we mine, we extract from rocks. Then we've got this lighter blue here, which is the non-renewable organics, and the green, the dark green, are wood products. And again, I want you to see that over the last 100 plus years, we have significantly, by orders of magnitude, increased the quantity of natural resources, each of these categories, that we as humans consume. Now you see a lot of ups and downs here. If we go back to the year 1900 and we move, follow my cursor, we move here from left to right, we can see these little peaks and valleys, these troughs. We can see World War I in this time frame. We recovered from World War I. We increased consumption, increased, increased. Then boom, we have the Great Depression. The Great Depression, what did that result in? It resulted in significant unemployment. Unemployment means less income. Less income means less discretionary income, which means you don't have enough or as much money to spend on stuff. And as a result of people not buying as much stuff, we see globally this decrease in the supply 
of each of these categories of natural resources. Then we have this climbing out of the Great Depression. In the United States, that was largely a result of Franklin Delano Roosevelt's Green Deal, excuse me, not Green Deal, New Deal. So FDR's New Deal. And we see that we climb up here. World War II was a major event globally and increased significantly resource consumption. And then we see a little bit of a drop here after World War II. And then as I talked about in the last lecture, remember that right here in the late 40s towards 1950 is we, we can see in the data a significant change in slope, rise over run. And so notice right here after World War II, boom, we take off. Look at all these construction materials. This is Levittown. These are our suburbs that we invented. This is under President Johnson in the 60s, the highways that the United States government built. This is building all of the buildings that house our hospital system, our health infrastructure. It just took off like a rocket ship. We see it grow and grow and grow and grow. We then had in the 1970s an oil crisis, which I'll come back to later in the semester. We climb out of the oil crisis. We then had two recessions in the 1980s. And you can see again, what's the impact of a major recession, similar to the Great Depression down here on the lower left. These recessions, or financial recessions, were periods of time where globally the amount of discretionary income that we had to spend decreased. And as a result of spending less, buying less stuff, we see less supply, less demand. And then we have the second recession here about 1990, and then we see this significant increase. And again, as I showed you in the last slide, we see that the mortgage crisis here around 2008, a global financial crisis, caused demand for resources to plummet. Now up at the top, I've got the title of this slide, Supply and Demand, and then I say, or is it demand and supply? One of the things I want to make sure that each of you really has a good feel for is that when we talk about demand and supply or supply and demand, there is no resource on the market unless somebody wants to buy it. And that's something that's important to remember, not only for this class, but in general. No company is going to mine copper if somebody won't buy it. No company is going to mine gold if someone won't buy it. So when we think about supply and demand, the other terms that I'll use in this lecture and, and in lectures throughout the rest of the semester are production and consumption. So we tend to think about production, what is the quantity of copper that mining companies produce? What is the quantity of gold that mining companies produce? That is synonymous with consumption because all of the copper that mining companies produce is being consumed in real time or in relatively real time. When we look at, in this case, three products, three parts of the stuff that make humans humans in 2021, we've got the automobile, the cell phone, the refrigerator, and all I want you to do here, I don't want you to memorize the percentages according to the y-axis, but let's just take a look at the legend. Let's focus here on copper. What do we see? We see in this lighter green color that the automobile, here's the copper, the cell phone, here's the copper, and the refrigerator all physically contain copper. These are directly embedded in the automobile, cell phone, and refrigerator. We see iron is the dark green. Here's iron in an automobile, iron in a cell phone, iron in a refrigerator. We see aluminum in the light blue. We have aluminum in a refrigerator. We have aluminum in a cell phone. We have aluminum in the automobile. And then we have plastics and composites. We have steel. We have rubber, glass, silica, other metals. So I want you to just take a snapshot here mentally and note that each of these products, we tend to think of a car as a car, or a truck as a truck, a cell phone is a cell phone. Well, a refrigerator is just a fridge, right? But if you actually disaggregate or deconstruct a car, a cell phone, a refrigerator, all of these resources 
are part of that car, that cell phone, that refrigerator, and they're all directly embedded within that particular thing. Now, here's another set of data similar to the, the plots I showed you a few minutes ago. And I want to make a couple of points on this slide and the next one. So here we're looking at, you can follow my cursor, we're looking at the U.S. growth in basic raw materials consumption. So again, how much humans in the United States consumed from the period 1961 to 2005 for steel, for cement, for aluminum, for plastics, and for wood. So these are the five natural resources or our manipulated versions of that nat the, the natural resources that humans were consuming. So here we've got a row of data. These are the years 1961 to 2005. And if we look at this as a function of how much we've increased as a function of time, we can see that we have almost a two times increase in our consumption of steel, 2.26 times increase in consumption of cement, about three and a half times increase in consumption of aluminum, almost 50 times increase in consumption of plastic, and almost two and a half times increase in consumption of wood. Now, relative to the blue, the blue row here, population increase in the U.S. was 1.61. So what we see for all of these resources is that we have consumed them faster on a per-person basis then we have actually experienced population increase, which means that for every new baby born in every year, we're using more of each of these resources than we did the year before. And if we think about plastics, this is a scene from one of my favorite movies called The Graduate. If you've seen it, I hope you agree. If you haven't seen it, it's a phenomenal movie. Don't watch it with your parents. Watch it outside of, of, of their view just because there are some scenes that are a little weird to watch with your parents. That's my opinion. So I'll just play it for you. What are you going to do now? I was going to go upstairs for a minute. Oh, I meant with your future. Your life. Well, that's a little hard to say. Ben. Excuse me. Mr. McGuire. Ben. Mr. McGuire. Come with me for a minute. I want to talk to you. Excuse us, Joanne. Of course. I just want to say one word to you. Just one word. Yes, sir. Are you listening? Yes, sir. Are you? Plastics. Exactly. How do you mean? There's a great future in plastics. Think about it. What do you think about it? Yes, I will. I've said, that's a deal. So this movie came out in 1967. That's Dustin Hoffman, a much younger Dustin Hoffman. Great movie. And I just want to bring it back here. I'll go back one slide for plastics. You know, when I was growing up, I don't remember any plastic bags in the grocery store. I really don't remember much plastic. All of the hangers we had in our house were made of wood or metal. Relative to today, where plastic seems to be simply ubiquitous in modern, excuse me, in modern society. What are you going to do that? And so we look at this increase of 50 times since 1961. Now, just to reiterate the point I made about the Great Recession, 2008, 2009, 2010, one of the things we can see now if we look at the data from 1961 to 2012 so we've added seven years after 2005. We see not much changed for steel, but we see cement decline. Why did cement decline? Because the economic recession caused a significant decline in the amount of cement used for new construction around the world. We see aluminum decline. Likewise, less aluminum was being consumed because of the Great Recession. We even see a decline in plastics. We see a decline in wood. So a key here is that these global events that cause less discretionary income on a per-person basis, the data tell us that that 
less income translates directly to the consumption of fewer resources. And then we look at the global growth, global growth around the world, and we see what we, we see a similar set of data as we saw for the United States. So again, globally, population growth was about 2.3. And I simply want you to take away from this row of data here for steel, cement, aluminum, plastics, wood, that except for wood globally, our consumption of steel, cement, aluminum, plastics, and virtually every other resource outpaced population growth. Now, we also have to think about the economics around resource consumption and resource production. So this is a snapshot with data compiled from the United States Geological Survey and the International Energy Agency. And all I want you to see here, the y-axis is trillions of dollars, and these data are a couple of years old, but the data emphasize that when we think about energy minerals, oil, natural gas, coal, uranium, we think about metals like copper and gold and silver and lead and zinc, and then we think about industrial minerals, minerals such as salt and potash, various fertilizers used for agriculture. I just want you to have in your mind and a, a realization that the value of these minerals is in the trillions of dollars with a T. So globally, these minerals, and we'll come back to the details, trust me, I know you hate to hear me say that, but globally, these minerals are extracted on six continents, Antarctica is the only continent where we currently do not allow mining. So all of these minerals or mineral groups are extracted on six continents. And as I showed you in the previous lecture, we trade them around the world. We've got 50,000 container ships out on the oceans right now moving energy minerals and metals and industrial minerals from one continent to another. And then we've got trucks and trains moving all of these natural resources within individual countries. So resources are a big part of the global economy. In the United States, we have a government entity called the United States Geological Survey, which is underneath the umbrella of the, the Department of Interior. So we have a Secretary of Interior, a cabinet level position. And the map here shows you each of these blue circles. The number within the blue circles is the number of individual United States Geological Survey or USGS offices that are located within a particular region. So for example, if we look here at Washington DC, within this blue circle there are 33 USGS offices. Between New York and Boston there are 18 USGS offices. In the Denver area there are 18 USGS offices. And among the things that the USGS does is they have within their structure people who are economists and the economists within the USGS, they track the production of resources around the entire world and they track consumption of those resources within and among all countries. So this is just a snapshot here because I, I know that I've got several and usually have at least a couple of dozen of econ majors in this class just a snapshot to give you a sense of the type of work that the economists at the U.S. Geological Survey do, tracking supply and demand. And one of the great things for, certainly for people in academia like me, and I would say everyone else, is that they make freely available on their website through the National Minerals Information Center, they make freely available all of the data that they track as open source and increasingly now, all of the data are made available as Excel files. So you can simply download the Excel files and manipulate the data. This is one of the most recent reports here that their economists came out with where they evaluated mineral, mineral commodity supply risks. And if you go to the USGS website, and this is an example I'll show you here in the next few slides for one particular resource. Every year they publish what is known as the Mineral Commodity Summaries. And this one is published for 2020, which means that they are analyzing data for the year 2019 and previous years. And you can see over here, this would be the PDF for the Mineral Commodity Summary 2020. 
And then down here you can see they've got the PDS format going back to the year 1996. So annually, each of these years is available on the web. And then they also have all of the data available and all of the tools that they use. So they're very transparent in terms of how they or where they acquire the data and how they translate that data into the documents that they publish. One of the things that they track is known as net import reliance. And this is a really important concept for everyone in the class, no matter your country of origin, although I'm going to focus here on the U.S. When we think about the net import reliance, there's an equation here. And the net import reliance, you can think of it as the amount of a particular resource that we produce within the United States relative to the amount of that resource that we import from other countries outside of the United States. And so you can think about a metal like copper or a metal like gold or a metal like lanthanum or dysprosium or neodymium, all of those sexy rare earths that make our smartphone work. When we think about net import reliance, we're essentially looking at how much can we produce domestically and how much do we depend on from other countries. So I'm going to show you here a few slides and I'm going to build it out, but I initially only want to focus on two types of natural resources. At the bottom we've got copper, and here towards the top we have rare earth metals, all of those sexy elements. And at the top is 2019 U.S. net import reliance. And what we see for the rare earth metals, and again rare earths are what make technology work. So in each of these technology products, neodymium, cerium, gadolinium, ytterbium, terbium, europium, praseodymium, lanthanum, without these rare earths, these technologies cannot exist as we know them today. If we look at, in this case, a Prius, or pick any hybrid car or electric car, what we see is we see that each of these rare earth elements, cerium, lanthanum, cerium zirconium lanthanum, neodymium magnets, all of these rare earths and other resources are required to make different parts of the car. So up here at the top, stick with my cursor, is a percent bar where the left is 100% and the right is 0%. And what we can see for the rare earth metals is that our net import reliance is 100%. What does that mean? It means that right now, 100% of the rare earths that we consume in the United States are imported. We produce zero rare earth metals. So we are entirely dependent on other countries producing rare earths and shipping them to the United States. If we look at the bottom for copper, we can see that our net import reliance is 35% for the year 2019, which means that we import 35% of the copper that we consume, and we produce 65%. And as you'll see throughout this class, copper is among the metals that we have an extensive amount of mining infrastructure built around in states such as Arizona and Nevada and Utah and Alaska and a few other states. So the United States, we produce about 65% of our copper and we import about 35% of our copper. The rare earths, we import 100% from other countries. Now, on the right-hand side, I've added some data here and some data here. These are the countries from which we import our rare earths. So when you pick up a smartphone or you drive a hybrid or an all-electric vehicle, your product contains rare earth metals from China, from Estonia, from Japan, from Malaysia. When you pick up a product that contains copper, that copper is likely coming from Chile, Canada, Mexico, in addition to the copper that we can produce domestically. And here is a snapshot built out for a number of other natural resources. So it's the same chart I just showed you. Here's the rare earths, okay? 
100% imported. And down here close to the bottom, where are we here with copper? Somewhere down here I think I saw copper. Down, oh, at the very bottom is copper. Remember, copper is 35%. So if we look up at the top, all of these resources that start at yttrium, from yttrium to arsenic, we import 100%, 100%, all of it, all of the arsenic, all of the asbestos, all of the cesium, all of the fluor spar, all of the gallium, all of the graphite, indium, manganese, mica, nepheline, cyanide, niobium, rare earths, rubidium, scandium, strontium, tantalum, yttrium, whew, all of those we import 100%. And then you can see here on the right, as the blue starts to decrease, the white part indicates how much we produce domestically. And then on the right-hand side over here, we've got the countries. Now, these are the major import sources. There are often many more countries producing these, but these are simply the major sources. And so one of the things to keep in mind throughout this class, and I hope in life in general, is when we think about the resources we use, and we go back to the Copper Age and the Bronze Age and the Iron Age, you talked about the Bronze Age, copper plus tin, and the trade routes that evolved around the Mediterranean, throughout Asia, China, Africa. We talked about climate change and the people of the seas and the collapse of the Bronze Age, the evolution of trade routes. Just take a snapshot of all of these countries, and when you're using a product like a smartphone or a laptop or a television, or you're taking a shower and you've got a hot water heater, when you plug something into a socket, you're literally plugging into natural resources that come from all of these countries across six continents around Earth. This is a, this is a slide here. Let's read the title. Comparison of U.S. Net Import Reliance for Non-Fuel Mineral Commodities. So the data here do not include fuels coal, oil, natural gas. The data here are specifically for all other types of natural resources. Copper, gold, silver, agricultural resources such as fertilizer. And the y-axis is the number of non-fuel mineral commodities. So think not coal, not natural gas, not oil. All the non-fuel mineral commodities. And what I want you to take away here is that as a function of time, from 1954 to 1984 to 2014, I want you to see that the proportion or our net import reliance on average for all resources, all non-fuel mineral commodities has increased, which means that in our lifetime, on average, your lifetime, my lifetime, your parents' lifetime, your grandparents' lifetime, your great-grandparents' lifetime, we increasingly year over year, rely more on other countries to supply us with the resources that we consume. And here is a set of data, and I highlighted this only for copper. So if you follow my cursor, okay, table one, this is the U.S. net import reliance as a percentage of U.S. apparent consumption. So what the USGS, the economists who work for the USGS do, is they look at how much of a given resource is consumed within the United States relative to how much of that resource we had to import. And so what you can see here is in 1990, our net import reliance for copper was 3%, which means that we domestically produced 97% of the copper we consumed. And then if you look at this and we move down the rows, down the columns, Notice what happens with copper. We go from 3% to 2% to 7%. In 2000, we have a net import reliance of 37%, which is almost identical to 2019. In the year 2004, we had a net import reliance of 43%, meaning that we only produced 57% domestically. So we can see that in general, for almost all resources, our net import reliance varies year to year. And when we look at, don't freak out by looking at all the data, and I certainly don't want you to memorize these, when we look at all the natural resources that the USGS economists track, 
one of the important things that we want to gain a sense of is how dependent we are as a country on resources from domestic mines, meaning mines that are producing that resource within the domestic borders of the United States, relative to our dependence on countries around the world. So now I want to take a little bit of a tangent and talk about what happens to all the resources, all the stuff that we consume. What do we do with it? Because one of the things that we're going to see as a theme throughout this class is our, our sort of balancing the resources that we extract from the ground, what we can think of as the virgin resources that we mine, new copper, new gold, new lead, new tin, relative to the resources that we have already mined that are embedded in our stuff and we have the ability to recycle. Something that is referred to as closing the loop. If I've already extracted gold and I've got gold in my smartphone and I want to build a new smartphone, well, why don't I just take the gold out of my old smartphone and put it in my new smartphone, right? Why don't we close the loop and reduce the amount of gold that we have to mine? So when I was growing up, this is all we had once a week at the end of our driveway. All we had was one bin and everything went in it. You know, we did not have smartphones, we did not have laptops, and so we didn't have the electronic devices that we have today. Everything was called garbage. Everything was called trash. And all of that trash, all of that discarded stuff went into one bin and once a week the trash company would come and they would pick it up and take it away. And I think for most of us, most of you, certainly most people in society today really don't have an understanding of what happens to that garbage when it goes away. What is that garbage? What is trash? Well, the academic way to talk about trash is this term up here, municipal solid waste, otherwise abbreviated as MSW. And if you Google MSW, municipal solid waste, you'll find a lot written on the web, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And again, I don't want you to memorize these data. I just want you to look at the pie chart here and get a sense of, on average, when we throw stuff away, what is the stuff that we're throwing away? On average, about 15% of what we throw away is food waste. On average, about 25% of what we throw away is paper. On average, about 13% of what we throw away is plastics. And then you can see the others here, wood, yard trimmings, glass, metals, rubber, leather, textiles. Now, 30 to 40 years ago, this all went to a trash bin. And increasingly, around the world, there's concern that with the absence of recycling programs, the amount of trash that contains resources that could be reused is growing to our peril. So I'm going to show you a video here, give you a sense of this. Hey, I'm Amir, and today you're going to find out what happens to your stuff when you throw it in a magical place called a way. Have you ever wondered exactly where your stuff goes when you throw it away? Probably not. I mean, why should you? You've already done your job sorting through your waste. Isn't it someone else's problem now? Let's dig a little deeper and get out of this out of sight, out of mind mentality. Because a way is actually a lot closer than you think. If your waste isn't sent to an Asian country, it ends up here in one of the active landfills in the US. So what exactly is a landfill? pretty simple. Cities pay a company to dig a hole in the ground, toss in the stuff we want to forget, and then put a cover on it so we never have to look at it again. Take this for example. This is the Puente Hills landfill, just a 10 minute drive from West Covina, California. It's 500 feet tall and covers 700 acres of land. It's the biggest landfill in the U.S. To put it in perspective, it's taller than the Statue of Liberty and covers as much space as 530 American football fields. Wow. So what actually happens to your stuff when it ends up in one of these landfills? Well, not much really. It just kind of sits there, decaying itself and everything around it for a while. But the landfills themselves, that's a different story. One big problem with landfills 
is they produce this toxic liquid called leakate. Leachate is basically all the nasty liquids that collect from all the stuff in the landfill. Like, you know when you take out the trash and it's got this sort of liquidy stuff at the bottom of the bag? It's kind of like that. But in a landfill, leachate is made of more than just pasta sauce mixed with soda. We're talking paint, pesticides, bleach, nail polish, medicine, battery acid, you know, the wholesome stuff. With tons and tons of garbage stacked on top of itself, all of the liquid waste oozes down and becomes a slimy cocktail of toxic chemicals. What are companies doing to make sure that the chemicals stay in the landfill? Engineers have designed liners and systems to collect the leachate, but the problem is the liners can be punctured. And if the chemicals don't leak out, wildlife can get into the landfill and cause all kinds of problems. One time, Hundreds of gophers and squirrels were killed to prevent them from digging holes and potentially leaking toxic chemicals into the San Francisco Bay. Let's have a moment of silence for the fallen. Once a landfill is full, companies are required to continue monitoring the groundwater and repairing leaks for 30 years. But after the post-closure period, their responsibility ends, and it's up to the public to clean up the mess. So if you think about it, we aren't paying landfill companies to dispose of our trash. We're paying them to turn it into future public health hazards that we'll end up footing the bill for. There are over 2,000 active landfills in the U.S., but with the average American throwing out about four and a half pounds of garbage a day, running out of space is a real threat. Which means we'll either have to open up more landfills or throw more stuff away to other countries. Those solutions smell like a steaming pile of crap to me. So what can you do? Well, you can reduce your waste by choosing products that have a longer lifespan. Things can be reused and repaired, like the good old days before everything was single use. And you can also choose to support companies that ethically source the production of their stuff and don't use excess plastic packaging. With 79% of plastics ending up in a landfill or the environment, more plastic is the last thing this planet needs. What are your ideas for reducing waste on a systemic level? How can we design a future where we stop waste before it's created? Let us know in the comments below. If you like this video, hit like and subscribe. Side, but in a landfill. Yeah, so that video hopefully certainly shouldn't have bored everybody, but you know, one of the things I just wanted to go back to and show you here. Oh, of course I'm not gonna find it. Oh. You know, this is a snapshot of the landfills around the United States now. Right? Each one of these dots represents a landfill, and, and the legend here is for methane generation, um, something I'm not going to introduce and talk about now, but chat with me during office hours and I can discuss methane generation. That's basically natural gas produced by the decaying of all the organic material, the food that we throw away. These landfills are everywhere, and historically everything went into the landfills. Televisions, computers, refrigerators, you name it, everything went into the landfills. And we knew this was bad, but we didn't have ways of reducing the amount of waste that went into those landfills prior to it was really a government-private collaboration that pushed the envelope on recycling. So for all of you listening right now, your whole lives have been about recycling, depending on where you're from. So for example, in the state of Michigan, somewhere on the order of 70 to 75% of the residents of the state of Michigan do not have access to recycling at their home. I know a lot of students that live in apartment complexes in Ann Arbor where you do not have access to recycling. And if you travel to rural parts of the state of Michigan, there is no recycling at the end of your driveway. The only way to recycle is to physically, for every homeowner, take that particular product back to a recycling center, which is among the reasons in the state of Michigan we have a, a deposit that we put down on glass and aluminum cans so that we can incentivize people financially to take those back and recycle them. And you see this if you go to Meyer or Kroger where you walk in and you can actually put your cans in and put your bottles in and you can get the 10 cents back per bottle. But when we look at recycling, 
we're not doing a good job. So here is, without showing you the data, the percent of total waste generation okay, for paper, yard waste, steel, glass, aluminum, wood, and plastics. And when we populate this with data, we're going to look at the amount recovered versus the amount discarded. The amount recovered is what ends up in the landfill. It is gone forever. It will never become part of another product, okay, because we have discarded it into the landfill relative to what we recover, which we've recycled and we can put into another product. But before I show you the data, I want to give you a sense of what does recycling look like? What actually happens to the stuff you put in the recycling bin? I've always been curious, so I decided to collect the recycling from our office and bring it to a recycling plant to find out. Follow me, we're going to find out the life of our recyclables as they go to a recycling plant. When I got to Sims Recycling Plant in Brooklyn, I found a huge warehouse where 800 tons of recyclables from all over New York are dropped off by barge and truck every day. The plant was built in 2013 and it's state of the art. It handles materials like metals, glass, and hard plastics. And after those materials are dropped off, they're sorted. So we take all of those unsorted recyclables and we're pushing it through our processing system, which is almost all automatic. It's about two and a half miles worth of conveyor belts, magnets, cameras, uh, all sorts of other machines dedicated to just sorting out different materials. The sorting machine is very high tech and sorts 14 kinds of materials, like glass, aluminum, cartons, and different types of plastic. Once enough of a material is collected, it's compressed into a 1,000 to 1,500 pound block called a bale. After the bales are sorted, they're sold to third-party companies. For example, a bale of aluminum might sell for $800. Buyers then take that raw material, clean and process it, and turn it into something new. This process saves way more energy than mining for virgin materials. The same amount of energy that it takes to make one can of new aluminum, you can make 20 cans from recycled aluminum. And using one ton of recycled plastic saves 16 barrels of oil. You have to think about all this stuff as coming from the earth, right? There's natural resources, oil, and all these plastics. And once you put it in the trash, it's going to a landfill or it's going to an incinerator. You're never going to use that material again. So it's super important we've got limited resources on this planet to use this, these kinds of materials as much as we can in the best way as possible. Despite the great setup at Sims, there are a lot of issues with recycling. First of all, Americans kind of suck at it. According to the EPA, about 75% of all of our waste is actually recyclable, yet our recycling rates hang around 34% nationally. That basically means that only a third of every single thing we use and throw out every day is making it to the recycling bin. And don't get me started with New Yorkers. We only recycle 17% of our waste. This is a garbage can right outside of our office. You can see there's paper and there's some cans in there, cups. All of these things are recyclable. And they're in the trash right when there's a recycling bin right next door. Only about 50% of recyclables in New York City are getting recycled right now. And I think that's largely a result of maybe a lack of public education, the fact that the rules have changed over time. Um, maybe some people just don't care enough or don't know why they should care. Um, and I think all of those kind of issues can really be addressed through education. For their part, Sims offers daily educational tours of their plant in an effort to boost our low recycling rates. Low rates aren't the only issue, though. Sam also told me about another problem called wish cycling. That's when people put trash into the recycling bin, hoping it can be recycled, when in fact it cannot. I would say it's about 10 to 13 percent of what we get is not something we want to receive. Those kinds of materials are maybe extra plastic bags, plastic film, maybe little bits of food scraps mixed in with those containers. Wish cycling wastes a lot of energy and fuel because items are shipped to a plant like Sims, sorted, and then eventually just sent to the dump. I wanted to see if my coworkers and I were guilty of any wish cycling, so I convinced Sam to go through our bag with me. We don't, we're not wearing gloves because, is that okay with you? Yeah, we do this every day. Okay. By looking through our bag, I learned we made some mistakes, like putting paper towels in the recycling bin. They're actually compostable. He also told me important tips, like cutting down on plastic straws. A lot of sort of single-use disposables that are really small, it's better to use less of these than to um, even try to recycle them because 
a lot of small plastics sort of fall through the cracks in the system. Thus. Reduce. Exactly. Sam told me that another huge misconception about recycling are plastic bags. We get about 18 tons of plastic bags here every single day. Uh, ideally, we would be getting nothing. Plastic bags are a low-quality kind of plastic, which makes them really hard to resell. For example, in Sim's case, they actually have to pay another company to come to pick up the bags and recycle them elsewhere. On top of that, the bags get stuck in the machine and can break it. So, if you want to recycle your plastic shopping bags, go to a plastic drop-off at a retailer like Whole Foods. Or better yet, skip the plastic bags altogether and bring a reusable bag. It's important to note that every city is different, so look up what your city's recycling plant accepts. Sims is one of the most inclusive recycling plants on the East Coast, and it accepts more materials than many recycling plants. But Sam told me to abide by the general rule. If it's a hard plastic, put it in the recycling bin. Seeing the 800 tons of recyclables at Sims was insane, but that's nothing compared to the 12,000 tons of trash residents of New York City throw out every day. I know seeing that made me more conscious of what I use every day, and it inspired me to cut down on single-use plastics. But let's be real. Plastic is still part of our everyday lives, and it's hard to avoid it completely. However, I've realized we can have a say in where it ends up, and while we're at it, help our environment and create a more sustainable future. All right. So now you know how... Now you have a sense of what happens to your trash and what happens to your recycling. And I want to go back and I want to emphasize a couple of points that she makes here. One, right, th this is just on some level horrific, right? If we think about all of the stuff that we have at home, 75% of it can be recycled. And yet we only recycle at about a 34% rate. And that varies. That's an average for the United States which means that we're recycling less than half of what we could recycle. Okay. Hold on, trying to find, oh, here we go. All right, I mentioned this concept of close the loop, and I'll come back to this in a few lectures when we talk about how much energy it takes to extract or mine a resource. If we look at aluminum, and we'll look at aluminum in the next lecture, the amount of energy it takes to extract or mine virgin aluminum, meaning aluminum that's in the Earth's crust, in the ground, the amount of energy it takes a mining company to extract and process and produce one aluminum can is equal to the amount of energy it takes a company to recycle 20 aluminum cans. Now, aluminum as a metal doesn't care how we use it. So the aluminum that's in your can of Coca-Cola, once you recycle that, think about how much less energy it takes to turn that back into another aluminum can relative to extracting virgin aluminum to produce that new can. And energy, which is, a, the, which is the theme of your discussion project this semester, we'll see that energy plays a huge role in the life cycle carbon footprint of consumption. And we see the same thing with plastics. So back to my video that I showed earlier, Dustin Hoffman in The Graduate, there's a future in plastics, right? The data that I showed you for the United States and for the world, we currently consume plastics at a rate that is 50 times what we did 60 years ago. There were no plastic bags in the grocery store that I worked in in the late 1980s, and today they've become ubiquitous, although now we see a big pushback, and we see a number of places within the United States and around the world that have banned the use of single-use plastic bags because they are difficult to recycle. As they mentioned in the video, they're low-quality plastic, and so when you put them into your general recycling bin, that actually causes problems for recycling companies. It's much better to take your single-use plastic bags back to the grocery store, and at almost all of our grocery stores, when you walk in, the foyer has a box in which you can put your plastic bags to recycle them. So energy is something that will be part of our discussion around mining. So here are the data, right? Here are the data for the percent of total waste generation, paper, yard waste, steel, 
glass, aluminum, wood plastics. And again, how much we recover, meaning how much we recycle, and how much we discard. So for paper, we're doing eh, okay. About 70% of the paper that we consume, we recycle, which means 30% we throw away. Yard waste, about 66% of the yard waste, we recycle that, which means 34% we throw away. Steel, we recycle about 33%, which means 67% goes into a landfill. So think about that. All of the steel that we manufacture, we extract iron and other metals, we manufacture steel, we build things with steel, and then we're literally throwing away almost 70% of that steel. We're throwing away 74% of the glass. We're throwing away more than 80% of our aluminum, more than 80% of our wood, more than 90% of our plastics. So all of this in the green up here, when I, when I introduced that concept of close the loop, closing the loop would mean that we get all of these to 100%, that we increase significantly to 100% or as close to 100% as possible the recycling rate for all of the resources that we consume. And if those single-use plastic bags are challenging to recycle, I think the easiest thing to do is not use them. So I mentioned this concept of direct and indirect resources. Direct resources are the resources physically embedded inside the product you're using, whereas indirect resources are all of the resources that are in the supply chain to make that product available to you. So back to this graphic of the smartphone, all of these elements here, they're physically part of your smartphone. They're physically inside your smartphone. What about all of the indirect resources? This is a topic that has been extensively studied, and one of the people who studied it is a friend of mine, Jennifer Barber, who was a professor in the Department of Sociology here at Michigan. She actually, last summer, she left the University of Michigan, and now she's a professor at the University of Indiana. But Jennifer and her colleagues here, they wrote a paper that I put into Canvas. And the title, obviously, here, you can read it. Social Organization and the Transition from Direct to Indirect Consumption. And when, when you think about indirect, there are a variety of ways that you can, you can define that. I want you to think about it from the perspective of trade routes and supply chain. And I want you to pause so you can read the text here. But the goal of this study and similar study is to try and understand the impacts on the environment from both our direct and indirect use of resources. They look at, for example, how big is our house? How much money does each house have? They look at communities in different parts of the world and what behavioral norms are associated with that particular community. And then I just copy and pasted, these are in quotes, some of the key parts of the paper from my perspective, from in my, well, this is in my opinion. So I guess you learned in discussion not to include opinions, but in my opinion, this is one of the, these are some of the most important things from the paper where they're looking at human consumption, human behavior, and degradation of the natural environment to try and understand what is our impact on the increased consumption of resources. And the fact that the majority of the resources that we extract today end up in landfills where we simply put a liner on the bottom, we cover them on the top. Now that's in developing countries, in developed countries. In most develop, developing countries, for example, when I travel to Ghana in West Africa, there is no formal system for removing trash and recycling. None. So you end up with a significant amount of trash either being burned, people literally will burn it in the backyard, or they'll burn it as a source of heat. They'll burn it as a source of heat for cooking. And if you think about burning plastic and burning other products that contain plastics, you automatically have a public health nightmare. So they look also at consumption of human and human-induced transformations of material and energy. So again, back to the energy involved in mining and consumption. 
They look at affluence. And this is sort of a no-brainer, right? They walk through here and then they reference a number of other studies, including one large study by the World Bank, where we would expect a relationship at the household level between the affluence, how much money the ha household has, and their level of consumption, and then their level of material waste. So I encourage you to read that, especially if you're a, a major in the social sciences, to get a sense of, you know, how are people in, for example, the field of sociology exploring the relationship between humans, natural resources, and waste. One of the things that has become a major focus in academic circles, and I would say even outside of academia in your lifetime, is what we call an ecological footprint which is a concept that we use to assess the amount of resources, right? So the amount would be how much, the quantity that we can measure of natural resources, all the stuff that we consume by people, and the amount of Earth's land required to support that consumption. And the ecological footprint is something that we can actually quantify, we can calculate, we can put a number on. And it requires that we know two things. It requires that we know the total amount of resources we consume, right? where we measure that in, in pounds or kilograms or grams or ounces, and where all the resources originate. So aggregating all of the Earth's surface that produces all of the resources that we use for energy, that we use all of the timber to make paper, all of the land surface used to make food and fiber, all of the land surface where we have settlements, where we live, all of the what used to be farmland in Long Island that became Levittown suburbs, all of the ocean that we use for our seafood. And this concept of an ecological footprint, I know there are classes in the EEB and Cs that focus on this, but for those of you that haven't been introduced to it, I'm going to use a short video that I think does a good job of introducing this concept of the ecological footprint. Hi, Alex here. What is our ecological footprint? Today I'm going to use illustration to explain what it is and how we fit our planet. So let's get drawing. This is what we need to provide the resources we use and to absorb the waste we produce. 1.5 planets. So that means that it takes about a year and a half for our planet to regenerate what we use in a year. The Global Footprint Network calculates every year Earth overshoot day. And in I'm going to stop it here for one second because there's a key aspect here that does not pertain to certain natural resources. So when he talks about the one and a half years, notice over on the right hand side he shows wood and he shows apples. This specifically only refers to natural resources that grow, meaning they are part of Earth's biomass. It does not refer to natural resources such as copper or gold or metals or fuel resources such as coal, oil, or natural gas. Use in a year. The Global Footprint Network calculates every year Earth overshoot day. And in 2013, it was on August 19th. So that was the day when we finished using our resources for the year. So think about it as a bank account. For the first seven months and 20 days, we lived on our annual revenue. After that, we spent our capital. Hmm, seems like there is something wrong with that math. Our ecological footprint measures how much land and water area we need to produce the resources we use things like energy, food, land for settlements, timber, seafood and to absorb the waste we generate. Our biocapacity is the amount of biologically productive area that is available to provide the resources we use and to absorb the waste. So we can compare footprint and biocapacity to see if we are well balanced or not. So let's dig into that a little. I live in Canada and our ecological footprint in 2007, that was published in 2010, was 7.01. Meaning that to provide what we consume every year, we need 7.01 global hectares per person. 
But we live in a huge country, and our biocapacity was actually 14.92 global hectares per person. So if we do the math, the difference was 7.91, which means that technically we are an ecological creditor country. Does that mean that it's okay to consume as much as we do? Well, not really, because if the whole world lived like us, we would need more than four planets to produce the resources we use and to absorb the waste, because not every nation has so much land, such huge forests, and so many other natural resources. The United States has a footprint of eight and a biocapacity of 3.87, so the difference is minus 4.13. So they are a big ecological debtor country. This is actually the case of most developed countries. Among the smaller footprints is the Democratic Republic of the Congo with 0.75. Although it's not an economically rich country at all, it has a biocapacity of 2.76. So you see that it's also an ecological creditor country with a difference of 2.01. The Global Footprint Network published the footprint in low, middle, and high-income countries between 1961 and 2008. This is the world's average biocapacity. What do you notice? Yeah, it is systematically decreasing. So basically, the story reads, the wealthier people are, the bigger the footprint. So when we can afford it, it's hard to resist, I guess. And this is also confirmed by the fact that 17% of the world population consumes 80% of the world's resources. So the main problem is not the absolute lack of resources, it's the fact that our global consumption is extremely uneven and inefficient. So these were footprints for nations, but you can also measure the ecological footprint of an individual, a city, a business, or all of humanity to assess our pressure on the planet. So I calculated my own ecological footprint on the Global Footprint Network website, and it is about 5.5. So why is it significantly less than Canada's footprint of seven? Well, mostly thanks to my lifestyle. I rarely eat meat, I drive very little, I live in a highly energy efficient house, etc. So, you can go and calculate your own personal footprint if you like. I included the link in the description below. So, the ecological footprint is a really useful way of understanding our relationship to the planet and how the ways in which we live impact our ability to survive and thrive as a race over time. So, try it. You may find it interesting. As usual, here are the key points to keep in mind. Humanity uses more resources than the Earth provides. The main problem is not the absolute lack of resources, it's the fact that our global consumption is unevenly distributed, that it favors only a few, and that it's also extremely inefficient. And the ecological footprint is a great tool to assess the pressure that we put on the planet. Basically, it helps us keep the big picture in mind and not get lost in the details. So in the next video, we'll use this ecological footprint combined with a few other things to create a powerful metaphor that describes our sustainability challenges. So stay tuned and thank you for watching. Yeah, so I hope that video was informative and I encourage you to take a look at it. You can calculate your own ecological footprint, but I want to come back to this particular part of the video, and it's something that, that we'll focus on throughout the lecture, and you'll definitely get a sense of, by reading the newspaper, when you think about the disparity of resource consumption around the world. If we just look at these two examples here, in the USA, Alex describes us as ecological debtors, meaning that we consume a lot more than the Earth can support. Whereas in the Republic, the Democratic Republic of Congo here in Sub-Saharan Africa, they are an ecological creditor. And if you look at the economies of the United States and the Democratic Republic of Congo, 
you'll see that the United States is the world's number one economy, and the Democratic Republic of Congo is one of the world's lowest economies. So again, back to the paper that Jennifer Barber and her colleagues in the Department of Sociology published, affluence plays a huge role in consumptive patterns. The more money we have, the more we consume, the more Earth resources are required to satisfy our consumption. So when we think about direct and indirect resources, remember direct means physically embedded in the product, indirect is in the supply chain, about 80% of the impacts that can be attributed to consumers are not direct impacts, but they're the environmental effects from producing the goods and products that we buy. So we think about a smartphone that has 70 elements, right? 70 elements of the 92 naturally occurring elements in the periodic table. 70 are directly embedded in our smartphone, but there are many more and a significantly larger quantity of many of those elements that are indirect resources. We think about energy. About half of the energy that Americans consume is energy used indirectly. And I, I say here with two questions, how and why, right? We think of the energy that we consume as, well, what is our energy consumption? We put gas in the car. That's energy consumption directly. We turn our thermostat up because it's really cold outside. That's energy consumption directly. We run the bath and we've got hot water in the bath and we know that the hot water heater consumes energy. Those are all direct uses of energy. But think about the indirect uses of energy. All of the energy that it took to make the car, all of the energy it took to make the hot water heater, all of the energy it took to make the food. And when we come to food, food accounts for 48% and 70% of household impacts on land and water resources, respectively. When we think about consuming meat and dairy and processed food, you know, you go to McDonald's and you buy the, the Big Mac and fries and a Coke, or you go to the Chick-fil-A and the, the Student Union and Ipsy, which apparently is super popular, right? All of the indirect resources that are part of the supply chain are significant. They're out of sight, out of mind. We don't see them, but they exist. They can be quantified. So this and the next two slides are going to look very similar. And I want to walk you through this. And again, I want you to take away the big picture. So if we look at this graph on the left, it's labeled carbon footprint. And we've got on the y-axis here are a list of countries, China at the top and Switzerland at the bottom. And then the x-axis is percent. And we've got here each one of the rows or these bars in the graph has three colors. One color for indirect domestic, one color for indirect foreign, and one color for direct. So direct would mean the carbon footprint associated or calculated for the resources that are physically embedded in the product that you're using. The smartphone, the laptop, the hot water heater, the vehicle, the, the whatever you want to call it, the pair of jeans. So if we look at indirect versus direct environmental impacts of household consumption for these 23 countries, and here when we think carbon footprint, we're talking about the amount of CO2 that's emitted when you drive a car. So when you drive a combustion engine vehicle, you've got gasoline. Gasoline contains, it's basically a soup of hydrocarbons. You combust those hydrocarbons, and one of the byproducts is carbon dioxide. So when we look here at the carbon footprint, what you can see is, Here's China, here's the United States. You can see that the largest proportion of our carbon footprint is indirect domestic. It's associated with all of the energy that's required to produce the products that we are physically holding in our hand and using. And then you can see we've got a smaller proportion here for the United States, the amount of indirect foreign. And then we've got the direct emissions related to the products we use. So again, just opening your minds up to this concept of the supply chain, the trade route. There is a carbon footprint associated with all of our products. And that carbon footprint, in terms of carbon emissions, it includes all of the emissions associated with mining, 
finding the resource, extracting the resource, and manufacturing and producing and transporting the goods for that particular resource. We can look at the same for material footprints. So again, the United States drops down a little bit on the list, and we can look at here, we've got two colors, indirect domestic and indirect foreign. And so again, if you look at the United States, we're about half and half. About half of the material footprint of the products we consume is indirect domestic, and about half of the footprint is indirect foreign. So again, this goes back to our net import reliance. And you can see for a variety of countries, the amount of domestic versus foreign that they rely on. So for example, down here at the bottom, if we look at Taiwan or we look at the Netherlands, the Netherlands in Europe, part of the European Union, they are almost entirely reliant on foreign materials. Look at this. Whereas in China, they are almost entirely reliant on indirect domestic materials. They have a major mining sector and they are one of the world's leading producers of material goods. We can also then look at the amount of water. And you might think, okay, well, what is the water that is part of the supply chain? The water includes everything from the amount of water that a cow drinks before it's butchered to produce the hamburger that you buy at McDonald's the amount of water that falls on the ground to produce the grain or the grass that the cow eats before it's butchered, the amount of water used to grow the soybeans before we take the soybeans and convert them to tofu to make the tofurkey, the amount of water here, we have three categories, the indirect domestic water footprint, the indirect foreign water footprint, and the direct water footprint. And again, you can see that by country, there are significant differences. So up here at the top, we've got India, one and a half billion people, China, one and a half billion people, Brazil ranks third, the United States ranks fourth, and you can see that our water footprint is dominated by indirect domestic, whereas if you come down here again to the bottom, we see the Netherlands here, a small country, primarily relies on imports, and we can see that here with most of their bar filled with indirect foreign, only a sliver of direct for their water footprint. So again, I'm just trying, not trying, I don't want you to memorize this for all these countries, just giving you a sense of how our consumption in terms of the water footprint, material footprint, and carbon footprint relates to our domestic production versus our need for imports. So one of the questions that I'm hoping you're asking yourself in your head then is, well, if we have this concept of a net import reliance, we know, for example, with copper that we produce 65% of the copper that we consume, we import 35% of the copper, where does the rest of that copper come from? If we think about rare earth elements, we import 100% of rare earth elements. Where do they come from? One of the things that we do is we can look around the world by region and we can get a sense of the resources that are both produced in a particular country, meaning extracted, relative to the resources that are consumed. So this is a figure I'll build out that's in our textbook, and this is specifically for iron and steel in several parts of the world. And I'm going to show you the U.S. up at the top first. So the y-axis I simply want you to think about as a function of quantity, how much, right? The higher the number, means the greater the quantity. As a function of time from 1970 until about 2006, I think, is when we, when we um, pulled these data. And here would be extraction. So if we look at North America, Mexico, the United States, Canada, with countries in Central America, but dominated by the United States here based on population and consumption behavior. If we look at the extraction of the resources, that are required to produce steel, we see some ups and downs, ignore those. What we see is, in general, a decline. Compare that to consumption over the same time period. So over the last 50 years, we are extracting less, meaning we're mining less iron in the United States, but we're consuming more. 
So if we're consuming more than we extract, what does that mean? It means that our net import reliance is increasing because we're importing more iron and more steel. And we see this for a variety of regions around the world. So here would be North America top right. Look at the left here for Japan and Korea. Japan and Korea have almost no extraction of iron, but they are large consumers of iron and steel. If we look at the European Union here, left center, the European Union extracts almost no iron, but they are large consumers of iron. If we look at China, we can see through the 1970s and the 1980s, up until about 1990, the consumption and extraction of iron and steel in China, they were roughly equal. And following 1990, notice that consumption has significantly outpaced extraction. So you look at the data for China, the European Union, Japan and Korea, and North America, and you've got to have an oh shit moment. How can we consume more than we extract? Well, part of that answer, and it's not a simple answer, but part of that answer here is on the center right for South America. Notice that in South America, the trends for extraction and consumption are opposite of what they are for the other regions around the world. South America consumes much less than they extract. Well, what does this mean? It means that South America extracts a lot of iron among the countries in South America that are iron producers. Chile and Brazil are major iron producers. They're extracting that iron and exporting it to other countries. Where are they exporting it? Well, they're exporting it to North America. They're exporting it to Japan and Korea. They're exporting it to the European Union. They're exporting it to China. And so for each of these regions on the left side of your screen and top right, where consumption is larger than extraction, we are reliant on South America and also places in Africa, which I don't show here. We're reliant on these regions to consume a lot less than they extract. And remember, extraction equals mining equals production. They consume a lot less than they extract and export that to make up for our net import reliance. So something else I want to emphasize in today's lecture, because now you have to be thinking, and again, looking at these slides, it's another oh shit moment. Well, if we're consuming more than we're extracting, could we run out? Could we run out of iron? Could we run out of steel? Could we run out of copper? What happens if South America in 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, what happens if South America consumes more than they extract? Is that possible? Is it possible for all regions on Earth to consume more than they extract? So how do you determine or calculate if we're running out of a particular resource, such as copper or iron or another resource? How would you actually assess that? especially considering, for the case of copper, that as you learned about in weeks one and two, demand for copper is predicted or forecasted to increase by at least 200%. So all the copper we've consumed up until 2021, throughout all of human history, going back to the dawn of the Copper Age, all of that copper, we are going to consume it again and again. And the reason is that if we look at, for example, as you see on the slide here, if we look at, for example, electric cars, the data on the bottom left, which are from Bloomberg, these data are the forecasted trends for the increase, or what they call the rise of electric cars, consumption of electric cars. And what we see around the world for a variety of countries here, including the European Union and the rest of the world up here on the top, is we see that the demand for electric cars will increase. And a lot of people think that's a great thing. You've learned now about the Green New Deal, FDR's updated New Deal 90 years later. Well, if we all drive electric cars, isn't that great for the environment? The answer is yes. 
Electric cars have a smaller life cycle carbon footprint than traditional combustion engine vehicles, but electric cars require more copper. So if we look at a traditional gasoline or combustion engine vehicle, on average it needs about 55 pounds of copper per car. A hybrid needs about 110 pounds of copper per car. And an all-electric vehicle needs about 165 pounds of copper per car. So if everybody stops, stops driving combustion engines and we start driving all-electric vehicles, then the demand for copper just tripled, which means that mining companies have to be able to produce triple the amount of copper to satisfy human consumption. And we see this when we look at any consumer product that contains copper. So here are data from another source. This is from the International Copper Association and the U.S. Global Investors. And they look, for example, at buses, hybrid vehicles, plug-in, battery. And again, what do I want you to take away? The big picture. The consumption of electric vehicles is forecasted to increase, which means the consumption of copper will increase. So, what else happened in our own backyard this week that is going to Today, affect General us? General Motors announced its plans to become completely carbon neutral by 2040. That means changing how their cars are produced and the fuel they use to operate. 7 Action News reporter Brett Cast explains what the move means for drivers. Every time you need gas, it could cost 30, 40 bucks to fill up your tank. But with this announcement today from General Motors, that could become a thing of the past. From the materials to the production, General Motors plans to be completely carbon neutral by 2040, revealing plans on how to get there. We have a vision, we have an aspiration, and we're taking action today with others to get there. The company says 75% of its carbon footprint comes from tailpipe emissions. That's why they now plan to roll out 30 all-electric models by 2025, making up 40% of the company's fleet. We're taking actions so that we can eliminate tailpipe emissions by 2035 because over the next five years we're spending $27 billion. $27 billion in five years, moving GM towards this environmental future they feel is also best for business. Allocating more and more of our capital and our resources to this transition. And we're doing that because we feel this is going to be the successful business model of the future. I never thought about driving one. For drivers accustomed to using the gas pump, they wonder how an electric car would work and how to charge it. Would you still have to plug up? Where are you going to plug it up? So as part of their plan, General Motors will add close to 3,000 fast chargers across the country by 2025 using renewable energy. As we have an increasing number of electric vehicles, it's important that they be charged with renewable energy. As more automakers push towards electric vehicles, drivers agree it's the way to go. These are economical, um, save on fossil fuels. It's going to lead to that. That's the future. Well, GM says it will source 100% renewable energy to power its sites across the U.S. by 2030 and globally by 2035. Reporting for 7 Action News, I'm Brett Cast. Brett, thank you. So let me highlight a couple of things they said. One, they said that 75% of the carbon emissions are tailpipe. What does that mean? It means, as I said earlier in this lecture, that when we pump gasoline into our car, and then we combust that gasoline, we produce carbon dioxide, which is an irreversible chemical reaction, and that carbon dioxide comes out of the tailpipe into the atmosphere. So 75% of the carbon footprint of General Motors vehicles is directly caused by driving them. Where's the other 25%? That's in the supply chain. So 25% of the carbon emissions for each vehicle are in the supply chain, including mining, shipping, and manufacturing. So what General Motors is doing here, by essentially becoming Tesla, all electric, is they're eliminating the tailpipe emissions. Because when you drive an all electric vehicle, you're only discharging batteries. There's no gasoline to put in them. And to answer one of the questions that one of the, the um, news reporters asked, uh, somebody in the video, 
You don't need gas stations anymore. With an all-electric vehicle, you don't need oil. You never have to change the oil. So the last gentleman who was interviewed, he said something to the effect of, it's all economic. And one of the things I want to promise you is that in discussion, you'll actually do these calculations. The major driving force to change human behavior such that all of us want to consume electric vehicles is that over their lifetime, they are less expensive than a combustion engine vehicle. And you can, you can calculate that in a number of ways, but they are less expensive. We tend to think about Teslas as being very pricey, and I'll agree the Model S is a very pricey model, but as General Motors and Ford and Chrysler and other car companies start mass producing all electric vehicles, and the prices come down so that you can buy an all-electric vehicle for $15,000 or $20,000, what we know is that they are less expensive per mile to drive. You never have to go to a gas station. You never have to worry about touching a gas pump. Think about how nasty a gas pump is. Like, oh, it gives me the heebie-jeebies to think about how nasty a gas pump is. Anyway, you plug it in at home or you go to a fast charger. And notice that General Motors also said that they plan on installing fast chargers around the country powered by renewable energy. And I promise you, if right now you're not a believer in electric vehicles and renewables, when you do the math yourself, you will be absolutely convinced that economically this is the way of the future. It doesn't matter how you vote, who you vote for, it is happening purely because of economics. So one other here, just to give you a sense of a future with copper. Wouldn't that be sweet? I'd love to have that. Uber could just fly you around without red lights. So what you're looking at here, obviously this is imagination of the future. But all of this takes copper, takes other resources. Like none of this grows on trees. All of it takes copper. So this is obviously pro-copper, but I think all of you watching can imagine a future that is different than today, and in order to build that future, in order to provide better and more accessible access to healthcare, in order to allow every boy and girl around the entire world to obtain digital fluency, to be able to have access to the internet, we need more copper. That's why we forecast the 200% increase. So how do you determine if we're running out? You need two pieces of data. You need to know how much of a particular resource we use per year, right? So something we measure, how many pounds of copper, how many kilograms of copper do we use per year? And you need to know how much of that resource is physically accessible to mine at the current price of that resource. And this is something that I'll touch on several times in the course of the lecture. So I'll just, I'll state this now and come back to it. When we talk about resources from a geologic perspective, a mining perspective, we're only talking about the amount of resource, the quantity, the pounds, the kilograms of that resource that we can physically extract or mine 
at a profit. And that's important because no company extracts copper to lose money. No company has a business model to lose money. So all companies that are extracting copper to make it available to us on the front end of the supply chain, they need to be able to make a profit, which is why I include in here the current price. So these are the two datum that you need. How much do we use per year and how much do we know is physically available to extract or mine at the current price? So here on the left hand side I've got a list or a column of a bunch of different resources, different metals, and copper I highlight down here in red. And one of the ways that geologists and economists think about this is years left. So how many years left do we have of copper? When is it going to run out? And what we need is we need to know what we call up here at the top the reserves, in this case the global reserves, where the reserves are the physical amount of copper that geologists have found around the world that we can physically extract and companies can make a profit by extracting or at least break even, not lose money. We need to know the reserves, how much copper is, is there that we can extract, divided by production. How much of that copper are we using every year? And then we also factor in how much of that copper is being recycled, meaning how much of it stays in our closed loop versus how much of it goes to a landfill. So for copper, we can go back to the United States Geological Survey and the National Minerals Information Center where their economists track copper every single year. They're looking at all of the data for mining companies around the world. They're aggregating all of those data. How much copper is the entire world producing in a given year? And how much copper is our global society consuming in that year? So if you go to the National Minerals Information Center, and the URL is up here on the top, you can download their reports, and this is their report for copper for 2019. So this is the most current set of data. And it's two pages, that's it. And all I want to highlight are a couple of things. One, they have a table here where they calculate the net import reliance. And again, we said earlier for copper for last year or for 2019 it was 35%. And notice it can vary a little bit. So remember, 35% of the copper we consumed in the United States was imported, which means 65% of the copper we consumed came from other countries. And then there's lots of other data in here that, in the interest of time, I'm not going to go into in detail. But if you're curious about all of these other um, parts of the data set, please talk with me during office hours. They also look at how much copper is recycled. They look at the import sources. So, for example, in the period 2015 to 2018, in the United States, we consumed copper from South Africa, Finland, Malaysia. We consumed copper from Mexico. We consumed copper from Canada. We consumed copper from Chile. Okay? All of these countries extracted copper and sent it to us. And remember back a few slides ago, I showed you that for South America, they consume less than they extract. Chile is the world's biggest producer or biggest extractor of copper and the majority of that copper they're extracting and exporting and among the beneficiaries is us, the us in the United States. On the second page of the report, okay, and again read all these details up at the top and talk to me during office hours, I just want to highlight what I've shown down here with the two black arrows. They have data here for mine production by the leading countries, and then at the bottom they sum this as the total amount of copper rounded to the nearest whole number, the world total, the total amount of copper produced, and remember produced is equal to consumed is equal to extracted. So all of the mining companies around the world produced, and I should have pointed out this 20,000, the data here, as are shown at the top of the first page, are 1,000 metric tons. Kind of funky how they do this, but just, just go with it. So it's 20,000 thousand metric tons of copper that were produced in 2019. Now the reserves are this column on the right. 
And remember, the reserves are all of the copper that geologists know physically exists in Earth's crust that can be extracted or mined at the current price for copper. And currently, that's 870,000 thousand metric tons. So we can take these two numbers, 870,000 and 20,000, and everything up at the top was the previous slides. And if we divide 870,000 by 20,000, we get a number 43.5. So 43.5 is the years left of copper. Well, what does that mean? Is that an oh shit moment? Like, oh shit, I'm 22, and by the time I'm 70, copper is gone? It does not mean that. Absolutely not. What it's telling us is that as of the year 2019, based on the reserves of copper, the quantified amount of copper that can be extracted at copper's current price, divided by how much copper per year society extracted and consumed, we can continue or sustainably supply that amount of copper for 43.5 years before this number, 870,000, would go to zero. But the thing to know is that this number, 870,000, changes. It's not fixed. So if, for example, we look at the data shown here for the period 1900 to 2012, on the y-axis, we've got years, and on the x-axis, we've got time. So we've got 1900 to 2012, and this line is the years left curve. So if we go back one for copper and we say, okay, in 2019, the years left is 43.5. If we go back to 1900, the years left was 50. If we go to 1910, the years left was, oh, I don't know, what do you think, about 37? If we go to 1920, the years left was about 40. So it changed a little bit, plus or minus maybe five over the two decades from 1900 to 1920. And then look at this, it shot up in the mid-20s. Well, the only thing that happened here was that in 1921, globally, there was a significant decline in the amount of copper production for reasons that I'm not going to go into here. And so the denominator and the numerator changed, and therefore we see this significant increase in years left. And then we see back to about a normal, maybe 45, 50. We see also 1932, at the tail end of the Great Depression, we see a significant decline in production of copper, extraction, mining, and we see this years left shoot up because consumption significantly decreased. So if the numerator remains constant and the denominator significantly decreases, then that ratio increases. And then we see that after the Great Depression ends, FDR's New Deal, we sort of come out here back to about our normal of 40, we go up to 60 in the late 1940s, and then we see some ups and downs, but sort of a general decline. In the year 2000, the years left was 32. The year 2010, the years left was about 35. And 2019, the year left, 43. Now, what does this tell us? One of the things this is telling us is that while consumption is increasing, geologists are doing a good job finding more copper. And that's a good thing. So as we increase the amount of copper we need for the Green New Deal, for the UN Sustainable Development Goals, for all of our electric vehicles, for solar panels, for wind turbines, what we know is that there is a sustainable supply of copper to build all of that infrastructure. And when we look at the years left, here's copper, 43 years, based on 2019 data. We can look at iron ore and aluminum and zinc and manganese and lead, nickel, uranium, titanium. What we can see is that for each of these resources, the years left, the reserves di divided by production, 
or the reserves divided by extraction, the reserves divided by consumption, we can see in the case of iron ore, and iron is what we use to make steel, we've got 178 years left. And that's based on current consumption and the current reserves for iron that geologists at the United States Geological Survey survey have quantified we have access to to extract at today's iron price. We have 200 plus years yet left of aluminum. So what you see, and for each of these, their 100 year chart would look something like this, their 100 years of data. So for each of these, they vary among and relative to each other, but there's not a concern we're running out, at least not now. So when we think again about the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, and we think about affordable and clean energy, SDG number seven, in order to have affordable and clean energy, what do we need? We need solar panels, we need wind turbines, we need battery storage, we need copper. If we want to have clean water and sanitation, we need piping, we need infrastructure, we need copper, we need iron. If we want to have decent work and economic growth, industry, innovation, infrastructure, all of these SDGs in some way requ require extraction slash mining slash production on the other end of the supply chain. The Green New Deal, which calls for 100% of U.S. primary energy to be replaced with renewable energy resources, including wind turbines. Every commercial wind turbine that you've seen photographs of requires four tons or 4,000 kilograms of copper. Every single wind turbine. Now, the good news is wind turbines can operate for 30 years, 40 years, 50 years. So once we extract that copper, and we use the copper to manufacture a wind turbine, we don't have to extract the same copper the next year, or in year three or four or five. So among the pieces of good news here is that as we think about transitioning to a world that relies increasingly upon renewable energy, and the tree huggers already want that to happen, I can promise the skeptics you're going to want that to happen when you see that it is economically the most sensible energy infrastructure that we can have as a society. We need more copper. We need more copper for solar panels and gold and silver. If we want to have grid scale battery storage, we need all of those resources. And the point I want to leave you with on this slide is there's often a disconnect between the people who support a Green New Deal and their thoughts on mining they're anti-mining but pro-Green New Deal. They're anti-mining but pro-renewable energy. And that is not possible. If you're pro-Green New Deal, if you're pro-renewable energy, then you have to be pro-mining. What we need to do though is we need to engage with mining companies to ensure that the way that we mine today has as small an environmental footprint as possible. And that's the end of this lecture, folks. Thanks for your attention.